It's been almost three weeks since John Allen Cho climbed into a kayak halfway around the world. He was determined to reach the shore of a tiny island in the middle of the ocean. His whole life, he'd been determined that he would take Jesus' word seriously. The commission he gave every single one of us to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. So in his 26 short years, John has led mission trips all around the globe so that he could fulfill the commission Jesus gave him to not only go and share Jesus with others, but to lead other people to do the very same thing. Now, John had been commissioned by God to tell everyone about Jesus. He was determined to share the gospel with the Sentinelese tribe who lived in North Sentinel Island in India's Bay of Bengal. Its members have been isolated for centuries. They reject every sort of outward influence, every sort of outward contact, and they rebuff them with violence. They don't want anyone coming to them. But God drew John's heart to them, and he said, John, I want you to go, and I want you to share the gospel with these people. I love them. So Cho hired a local fisherman to transport him within about a half a mile of the island. And then he put his canoe in the water, and he rowed over to the, to the island. That afternoon, he came back to the boat. The second day, the fisherman brought him out there about a half a mile away. He rowed over to the island. This time, this time he made contact with the islanders. And the islanders were not happy. They, they trashed his boat. A matter of fact, they, they shot arrows at him. One of them went through his Bible. John had to get in the water and swim back to the boat. Now, what would you do if you had been, been rejected not once, but twice? What if God told you to do something and you met with resistance? Would you assume that you misheard God? Would you assume, assume that maybe you didn't quite get the message right? Or would you push forward because you loved and trusted God and you wanted to be obedient and do what your father told you to do? Would you continue to entrust yourself if the opposition increased? Mary and Joseph were asked by God to do something unprecedented. I mean, let's be real. Who honestly believes that a virgin can conceive? And <clears throat> why in the world would anybody think that God would choose a backwater town like Nazareth to bring not just Israel's Savior, Messiah, but the Messiah for the entire world into existence. And why would we ex be expected to think that God would do that, bring Messiah into the world through a, a young, uneducated, no consequence teenager? Seems beyond belief. Joseph was young probably about 19. He had grown up with his father being a carpenter, so he learned the trade. And as he got older, and as, as he got more experience, people in the community began to notice that he had some skill as well. Well, with some glorified imagination, I kind of suspect that, that maybe as Joseph got older, he was probably an older, I mean not Joseph, but his father, was probably an older man when he, when he had Joseph, and as Joseph got up to marriageable age, around 19, he, he probably kind of lost some of the strength in his, in his back and his arms. And, and so he wasn't able to, to do the hard work with the hammer and the chisel. And, and the arthritic hands that, that had served him so well kind of kept him from being able to drive the nails anymore. So Joseph was taking a more prominent role in the family business then people were beginning to notice. People were beginning to notice that Joseph 
Well, he was quite a craftsman as well. So when he became sole proprietor of the family carpentry shop, he didn't skip a beat. His business didn't go down. People were just as pleased with his work as they had been with his father. Now Mary, Mary was a lovely olive-skinned beauty with jet black hair, an infectious laugh and a smile that lit up the room. She was probably 14 or 15. They were in love. Their marriage had been arranged for them by their parents when they were children, but they didn't mind. They were excited to begin life together, but not this way. They were betrothed, promised to one another. So betrothal doesn't mean you're actually officially married, but the, the bond between a couple who are betrothed is so strong that in order to break that bond, you have to get a divorce. These two loved each other, and they were proud when people referred to them as husband and wife. Joseph was excited to see Mary. She'd been gone for three long months. Do you remember what it was like when you were in any of those who were engaged? Do you remember what it was like? I remember I was going to school in Texas and Connie was living here. Now, if you've driven from Dallas, Texas to here, it's about a 14 and a half hour drive. I did it in 13. <laughs> we burned the phone lines up like crazy. And we were separated from one another for months. Now, I can't imagine what it was like. I can feel the feeling Joseph had. So he's excited. Mary has been gone for three months to visit with her cousin Elizabeth. She comes back, and he expects that he's going to enter into their house, and it's going to be filled with relatives. It's going to be filled with family. Not only are they welcoming Mary back, but they want to hear all about Elizabeth, this miraculous thing that happened. And so he's there. He's at the door. He goes in, and he's expecting a party. And yeah, the room is full of people, but it is deathly quiet. The only conversations are the hushed whispers in the corner as people begin making their way out of the house. Some of them, especially the older ladies, glare at Joseph. You know why. Some of them just looked at him sadly. Joseph looked around with with bewilderment. What in the world is going on here? He went over to his in-laws and he, and he tried to ask them what was going on and his father-in-law held his hand up. I don't want to talk to you. He didn't say it. He just held his hand up. His mother-in-law burst out in tears. Her husband put his arm around her shoulder, began whisking her out of the room and he turned back and he pointed to the room where Mary was. Joseph walked into the room and he said, Mary, Mary, what in the world is wrong? What, what's going on? Why is everyone so? And the words hung in the air as he caught his first glimpse of Mary's profile. He said, Mary, honey, come, come out of the shadows so I can see you. She made her way to him slowly, timidly, trembling. She did it. She betrayed me. How, how could she? Why would she? And what am I supposed to do now? How am I supposed to handle this? His head spun, his mind raced, his blood boiled. The law was clear about things like this. Unfaithfulness of this sort was supposed to be dealt with severely to eradicate sin from the family, from my family, from our community, from Israel. But oh, he loved me. 
to Mary. He was at odds with himself. He did not know what to do. <laughs> he wasn't sure how he was supposed to handle this. It was done now. And all that was left for him to decide how to sweep away the pieces with his dreams of their life together swelling out of proportion he was faced with a heart-wrenching decision Matthew 119 says and her husband Joseph being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame resolved to divorce her quietly he stormed out of the house it was his turn to pass his in-laws without saying a word the shame and the guilt written all over his face as, the, as his tears stung his cheeks. He didn't know what to do. He couldn't believe it. His precious Mary, she would never do anything like that. How could she? Why would she? What am I supposed to do? And he, he blasts into his house, past everybody, throws himself on his bed, and he begs God for sleep. He doesn't know what to do, and he just hopes that maybe if he goes to sleep, He'll wake up and realize it was all just a bad dream. He passed a, a fitful night. And in the small hours of the morning, he finally got the relief that he wanted. As he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save their people from their sins. And this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Joseph woke with a start. Behold, the virgin shall conceive. Behold, the virgin shall conceive he realized that Mary had been faithful to him that God had entrusted to her an incredible honor she would bear the son of God in her body God was taking on flesh and he was using her to incubate this incredible incredible being then the blood I think probably drained from his face a little bit when it dawned on him I'm going to be his father imagine what that would have felt like to know that God in the flesh is going to grow up in your household you got any habits that you think God probably isn't happy with can you imagine? You know what toddlers are like, right? You go, you, you, you say something you shouldn't say about somebody else, and you go to lunch with them, and what do they say? They tell them what you said. Imagine, uh, Dad, I, I don't think you're supposed to say that even if you slam your hand with a hammer. Anyway, I think that there was a lot going on for Joseph and Mary that we don't usually think about. Imagine what it would be like for them. Imagine God asks you to do something that you know is going to put you in opposition with other people. Are we willing to do it? Or do we think, no, God would never ask me to do that. God would never put me in danger. God would never want me to be on the opposite side of society or culture. See, I think that's what Christmas is all about. I love presents. I love Christmas carols. I love the decorations. I love the candles. I love all of it. But I don't want us to forget what it's really all about. It is about God coming to the earth because he obeyed his father. And he sacrificed out of obedience and love for his father and for us 
And he is not beyond telling us to do the same thing. When I think about Joseph, I think, I think that he was probably feeling honored to be entrusted with God's son by God. But I think it was also a burden that really weighed him down. I mean, think about the reaction that Mary received from her family and friends. Think about the reaction Mary received from Joseph himself. That was the reaction they would get throughout all of their life. This was not going to be an easy blessing for God to give them. I wonder if Joseph thought, you know, I kind of wish God would have blessed somebody else with this. You ever have something come into your life and you think, you know what, this is just too much for me to bear. I wish God would have blessed somebody else with this. Let Christmas remind you that God's not beyond that. God actually has a purpose and a plan for things like that. We'll see some of that in just a moment. Joseph knew what he would do. He ran to Mary, he barged into the house, he rescued her from the tongue lashing that Mary was receiving from her mother. He said, I understand, Mary. God came to me in a dream. I know who this child is. Mary. Mary. I know whose this child is. Turned to his in-laws and he said, this is my wife. We don't need a ceremony. We'll be going home now. Now he didn't do it in defiance. He did it as, as, as respectfully as he possibly could, but he knew that her parents did not believe her. He also knew that they didn't believe him. But it didn't matter because he had heard from God. You see, that's the key. It's not about whether or not you and I can have the courage to do the, the scary thing. It's about did God speak to me? Did I hear from God? If I heard from God, if he said it in his word, or sometimes he even speaks to us in ways that we, we can't really explain, if God has spoken to us, then we stick with it. Because we love him, because we believe him, because we trust him, even if it costs us, even if it costs us greatly. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife. They began life together. Things did not go as they had been dreaming they would all along. Word travels quickly in the small town of Nazareth. Orders were canceled. Old friends, even family members who had never used another carpenter took their business elsewhere. And Joseph's father came out of retirement. Family gatherings that had once been fun and festive were now uncomfortable and shame-filled. Even Mary's grandma, who always had a kind word for her pretty little Mary, all she did was hiss at Mary as she stooped down to hug her. It was uncomfortable. It was difficult. Joseph even began going to the market. Though people gossiped, none wanted to confront the young carpenter whose arms, legs, and back were well-muscled after years of working in his father's shop. The nest egg that Joseph had built up for them was dwindling away as he supported his new family. But, God's timing is always perfect. God knew exactly what needed to happen for Joseph and Mary. He knew exactly how to handle the situation for them. He had given them a wonderful blessing. Mary was carrying his son. And we read this. In those days, a decree went from, out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. 
This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. There you have it, a chance for a fresh start. Although I don't imagine that a ride on a donkey when you're nearly nine months pregnant was Mary's idea of a good time, I think they were both ready for a fresh start, happy to leave the place where Mary no longer wore a halo. Instead, she wore a shadow. But news travels quickly in Israel. I think there are potentially two reasons why the census would have driven Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem. We, we read in the passage that, that that's his lineage, so he would go back there because he had family there. He would also go back there potentially because as being, having his line emanate from there, he probably owned property. And census was often based on their property. So they went back there but for the two reasons they went there, they were, it was, they were no help to them. If he had property there, which it seems probable that he did, it was uninhabitable. He ended up in a stable. And if he had family there, which we know he probably did, their shame had traveled fast ahead of them at the speed of sound. And nobody took them in. Nobody cared for them. Nobody wanted them there. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. God honored this young couple who loved him with the privilege of giving birth to and raising his son. But that honor bore a heavy price tag. In his daily commentary, Jim Dennison said this, Job testified, though he slay me, I will hope in him. Jesus prayed in the garden of Gethsemane, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Our faith is most persuasive when it is most tested. Our faith is most persuasive when it is most tested. So do you think that God has a purpose for tests in our lives? And what's our natural reaction when something hard comes into our life? Sometimes our reaction is, God, why'd you do that to me? Or we get mad at God. Or we turn away from God. Or we get angry and we blow up and we reject our faith when we need to realize that part of loving God means that we become like God. And when we become like God, the world that we live in doesn't like us. Now, if we're being idiots, that's a different story. But the cross of Christ is offensive. And so as followers of Jesus, we need to realize that our Faith is most persuasive when it is most tested. And so we should expect for it to be tested. I wondered as I, I read about John Cho, what motivated him? Why was he so driven to go to this island? An island where for centuries no one has ever talked to these folks. Why did he care so much about, about him? One of the things I read about him is the third time that he, well, all, all three times that he went to the, to the shore, but especially the third time, he started off by saying this, my name, my name is John, I love you, and Jesus loves you. So what motivated him was his love for Jesus. Now, as you may or may not know, John Cho did not come back from his third trip to the North Sentinel Island. Before he left the boat the last time, 
Cho wrote a note to his family. You guys might think I'm crazy in all this, but I think it's worthwhile to declare Jesus to these people. And then he said, please do not be angry at them or at God if I get killed. Rather, please live your lives in obedience to whatever he has called you to. And I will see you again when you pass through the veil. Joseph in the first century, John Cho in the 21st century, young men, honored, blessed by God with an incredible honor to carry the message of God's love into the world, to take that message everywhere, even to the places where you might lose your life. Christmas is not just a time for family. It's not just a time to celebrate Jesus. Christmas is a reminder that to live for God will cost. Joseph, Mary, John Cho, they're not throwing down some sort of gauntlet here. They're simply reminding us what the Christian faith is about. It's costly. But the benefits that derive from our willing, obedient sacrifice bring blessing to the lives of those around us as well as blessing in our own lives. Because not only will God work in us and there's nothing like the experience of feeling God flow through you, but he will bless the other folks that we share Jesus with by changing their life right now and for all of eternity. There is no greater purpose in life. Our purpose in life is not to be wealthy. It's not to be powerful. It's not to be influential. Our purpose in life is to take the kingdom of God with us everywhere we go. His kingdom spreads as Jesus rules and reigns every moment of every day in your life and mine. That's what he's about. That's what he wants us to about to be about and at this time of year we spend a lot of time effort and money trying to find the perfect gift for the people we love and I, I, I love that it makes me think in specific ways about people that I care about I like, I like seeing their faces light up when they open the gift and it's something they really wanted But Christmas is not about us and gifts. It's about Jesus. And the question I think we should wrestle with today is what gift am I going to give God? What is it that, that God wants me to give him? I mean, what do you give a God who has everything? You give him the one thing he wants. You give him the one thing that he wants. Let that thought dangle for just a moment. What is the perfect gift that we could receive? Jesus. He's the perfect gift. He is the one size fits all Savior. No one is too bad or too far away. No one is so good that they don't need Him. We all need a Savior. I need a Savior every day. Every day I realize just how sinful I am. And when, I, when I'm left to my own devices, I'm, I'm a sinner still. Even though he's redeemed me and he's changing me. And so do you. Jesus is the perfect gift. He's the one size fits all savior. And all that is necessary is for you and for me to tell him. Because I have been entrusted by God to bear this precious message of life, the life of Jesus, to this world. And you have been entrusted by God to bear the same precious message of God to the world. All that's necessary is for us to go. All that's necessary is for us to share with them. Is there anyone in your oikos? We use that odd term here. Oikos is the Greek word for household or family. And when we use it, we talk about the 8 to 15 people that God has brought into your life that you have influence over. 
co-workers, family members, neighbors, people on your sports team? Do you have anyone in your life who needs to know Jesus? Could it be that God is calling you today to commit to begin praying for an opportunity to tell them about Jesus? You say, but Lynn, I don't know what in the world to do. Do you remember the study in the Gospel of Mark that we just did? Remember when Jesus sent the disciples out and they were proclaiming the kingdom of God but they didn't understand the kingdom of God and God worked through them anyway? You go and God will give you the words. You don't know what to say? Call. I'll pray for you. We'll talk about it together. Is there someone God's putting on your mind right now? Maybe he's calling you right now to be uncomfortable and to ask him to open up a door that you willingly walk through. That's one way to take this truth that we're looking at here and apply it. Take the gospel message just like Joseph did, just like John Cho did to that person who needs you. I've been reading a, a book here recently called Good Faith. Subtitle is being a Christian when society thinks you're irrelevant and extreme. That's kind of us. This principle applies not just in sharing the gospel, it applies in how we become the gospel with people around us. Listen to this. When we relate to people who are not Christians, whether secular or of another faith, we have to get the love plus believe plus live equals good faith equation right. As our friend Barry Corey says, Christians should have soft edges and firm centers. Soft edges and firm centers. Jesus related to people this way. Think about his interaction with the woman at the well or his responses to his interrogators or his life-giving answers to those with hungry hearts. He spoke truth from a firm center, but his hospitable, humble, soft edges allowed people to get close enough to hear him. We share the love of Jesus with a solid foundation. We don't change the gospel message. The only thing that's going to save people is the truth of the gospel. They have to understand, we have to understand that we're a sinner in need of a savior. We don't change that. We have to understand that Jesus, yes, Jesus is the only way to God. We have to understand that. We cannot budge on that. And that puts us in the crosshairs of many in our culture right now. We have to understand that we have to bring all of ourselves, just like we are, sin and all, to God so that he can forgive us. Yeah, we are sinners who need a savior. And we have to understand that we can never be good enough. We can also never be bad enough for him to say no. We need a savior. And so do they. But we need to come at this with a firm foundation and a loving heart, loving hand. I've been chosen by God to bear his precious message of love to the world and so have you. To do so is not always convenient. It's not always comfortable. Opposition is stiff and unrelenting do it anyway come to God and say I love you and because I love you I want to share your love with other people and when we share his love with the world without, without concern for the consequences we give God the only gift he ever desires this Christmas give God the gift of loving sacrificial obedience let's pray together Father none of us is worthy of the honor you've bestowed on us to send your son to die in our place and then to entrust us with the precious message of your son to bring life to other people in this life now and for eternity. 
Father, you, you know the places you put your finger on each of our hearts and minds. Whether it's somebody who needs to know Jesus or some way that we need to allow you to transform how we treat other people so that they see Jesus alive and well in us. Whatever it looks like, Father. Help us to be firm, to have that solid foundation, the solid center and the soft edges so that your gospel can flow through us this Christmas. In Jesus' name, amen.